My name is Chris Adam. I'm uh, an associate at the CSAE and um, uh, head of department of the Department of International Development here in, in Oxford. Uh, nothing to do with DFID. Uh, the confusion is often made, but we're just a, a department of the university. So it's my great pleasure to um, moderate this first plenary session uh, on the theme of recent IMF research on inclusive growth and low-income countries. Um, one of the reasons why we decided to, to put this session together is that there is, in, in the world that most of us inhabit, a, a pretty well-defined view of what the fund does on the research front. And most of us sort of think of fund research as being quite narrow and very much focused on uh, issues of stabilization and, and macro balance, so sort of short-run cyclical concerns about macroeconomic management. Over the last, I don't know, maybe decade or so, the fund's uh, research agenda, particularly the research agenda on low-income countries, has broadened quite substantially, in part through support from the other DFID, from UK's Department for International Development, who have supported a, a, a couple of programs that have been focused on um, a broader agenda of research on low-income countries. And what we've got today uh, in the next hour and a half is, in some sense, um, a showcase or taster menu for some of that, that research. We're going to have a number of presentations, uh, and uh, inevitably they're, they're going to be quite brief, but they hopefully will give you a flavor of some of the work that uh, the fund is doing on its uh, low-income country agenda. So I'm going to briefly introduce the, um, uh, the participants in this panel, uh, say a word or two about the format, and then we'll, we'll get started. So, um, to my immediate left is, is Jonathan Ostry, who's the Deputy Director of the Research Department in the IMF. Um, to his left is Chris Papagiorgio, who is the Division Chief, a Division Chief in the Research Department, and he coordinates this IMF DFID research program. Far end, uh, Davide Furcheri, who is a Senior Economist in the Research Department, and Next is uh, Stefania Fabrizio, who is the Deputy Unit Chief in, in another division in the uh, our department in the fund. Uh, it's called SPR, or Strategy Policy and Review Department. And the two departments, SPR and the Research Department, together run this, this research program. On my immediate right is our discussant, and I will introduce him more formally once we've had the presentations. So, um, we're going to start with going to take the four presentations back to back for the first hour or so and then I'm going to um, offer uh, the floor to Benno to, to act as a sort of a super discussant saying a few words about the, uh, the presentations as a whole and then after that I will open it up for uh, comments and discussion. Ideally we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for, for open discussion. So that's the format. Uh, my job then now becomes uh, simply one of being a timekeeper uh, because we are going to be quite tight on time. Um, and I will wave my red and yellow cards in good uh, <coughs> Premier League fashion at, at the speakers as we proceed. A red card just means wrap up um, uh, in the next minute, if you wouldn't mind. So, um, Jonathan, can I invite you to... Uh, Make the first presentation. Okay. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks uh, to the organizers for allowing uh, my colleagues and me to, uh, to speak today. It's a great pleasure to be back in Oxford and, uh, and uh, engage with you. Um, so um, the other speakers are going to uh, focus on a lot of the uh, nitty-gritty of the research agenda, this, uh, uh, this DFID IMF research agenda. I'm going to... Uh, stay high above the clouds and talk to you a little bit about sort of the ethos behind it, um, uh, behind some bits of it. I don't, I don't pretend to speak for the, for the whole thing. Um, some of the stuff that, that I have personally been engaged in uh, uh, on, on uh, uh, some of the new issues that, that Chris mentioned uh, that the fund uh, has, been, has been pursuing. So... Um, when I came to the fund, and for, for quite some time uh, later, um, I, I would say that the sort of 
you know, not to caricature too much, the, the prevailing view was let's focus on growth. Let's not uh, obsess about distribution. And, and the idea that, you know, this was an idea that I was indoctrinated in, uh, you know, when I was in graduate school, growth will trickle down. Uh, and also, um, redistribution is harmful for growth. And, you know, um, as recently as a few years ago when Tom Sargent um, uh, won his Nobel Prize, uh, I think he, he essentially, you know, it, it's not a huge paraphrase to say that one of the, the ten basic truths that he spoke about uh, in economics is a version of the second bullet on this page. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about, about how, uh, uh, how we get growth going, but at some basic level, we think we know some of the building blocks of growth. We need to strengthen the supply side of the economy, and that's about structural reforms, liberalization, deregulation, and being open to trade, to capital, to labor, um, globalization in a, world, in a word. Uh, and also, of course, very dear to the IMF's uh, heart, uh, you've got to keep your macro house, uh, your macro policy house in order. You've got to have low inflation and, uh, you know, public debt on a, on a, nice, uh, a nice trajectory and, and modest uh, fiscal deficits if you need, you need to have deficits at all. Um, and, and the roots of, of, this, of this kind of narrative go back a long time. There's a quote here from Schumpeter. It probably goes back a lot earlier. There's, you know, when I was at graduate school, I was at the University of Chicago. Uh, Bob Lucas uh, was writing papers um, uh, uh, that included these, um, these quotes at the bottom. But, you know, one of the ones that I think um, uh, perhaps is, is less, uh, less known than the one in the middle, and I'll read it out, of the tendencies that are harmful to sound economics, the most seductive, and in my opinion, the most poisonous, is to focus on questions of distribution. So what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is politely disagree with uh, Bob. Now, um, uh, you know, I think countries, uh, policymakers around the world have largely listened, have largely absorbed and internalized this narrative about strengthening uh, the supply side of the economy in order to uh, lay a firm foundation for growth, and here are some pictures about that. Um, but the view that I, I'm going to um, uh, argue for in, in this talk is uh, really that we need, uh, far from um, uh, putting distributional questions to the side. In fact, we need, uh, we need to learn to walk and chew gum at the same time. We need to focus on questions of the size of the pie and how the pie is divvied up uh, together. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, well, we'll come to the reasons, but, but uh, essentially the, the reason, um, the most important reason doesn't have to do with uh, your view about the social welfare function, and I expect that everyone's view uh, probably a little different in this in this um, in this room. It's not because uh, we we have different views about inequality. That's not the reason. The reason is that even if you don't care at all about inequality, if you ignore distributional questions, um, it will come back to bite you on the thing that you do care about, which is strengthening the size of the pie, laying a firm foundation for, for prosperity. So ignore, ignoring distributional questions is bad, even if you put no weight in your social welfare function on distributional questions. And so that has a number of implications, but a few of them are here, which is that um, you know, uh, you know, distribution doesn't just fall from the sky. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, it, it may be comforting to some in the room to think that well, it's all due to technology. Inequality is, is because of technical, technical change and technical progress. But in fact, a lot of inequality uh, is, um, is related, uh, is due to the kinds of policies that governments uh, pursue the bread and butter policies that the IMF advises on. So um, we need to think about the growth equity trade-offs involved in those policies when we design those policies. Of course, you can say, well, we'll fix it up later with redistribution, but that could be, that could be not the most efficient way of doing stuff. So you want to think about distributional questions when you design policy. And you want to think about distribution, uh, distributional questions when you 
uh, set up your posture in relation to globalization. And all of the debates about globalization that we read in the newspapers every day really has to do uh, with trade, and that's very important. But um, one of the things that we have been working on is the globalization of finance and the equity efficiency trade-offs uh, inherent in uh, being open to capital flows. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to have time to talk about the third thing, but obviously fiscal policy uh, has, uh, presents a bunch of distributional challenges as well. Um, you know, uh, austerity, of course, is rarely good for the poor, uh, and, and, so, uh, and so there are some issues there that I will not get to talk about. So to anticipate the findings, um, uh, the work that we've been doing suggests that inequality and fragile growth are two sides of the same coin. So tempting as it is to sort of, you know, policymakers uh, sometimes have trouble, uh, you know, thinking about two things at once. You know, they're, they're, you know, there's a temptation to have what you have on the front burner and then everything else is on the back burner. But actually that's not going to work here. It's not going to be uh, feasible to uh, let's, let's push full steam ahead to get growth going and worry about distribution later because, um, as, I, as I argued earlier, um, uh, you know, when you have a, a lot of inequality, um, your growth is going to be more fragile. And that is, that is a, a finding that I think is, is fairly robust. Um, and it's a finding that I think underpins when you, when you read books like Fault Lines or uh, if you read books by Raghu Rajan or Joe Stiglitz, these are some underlying themes about the fragility of growth that, uh, that, is, uh, that has been accruing to the few. Um, and there's a wide range of policies that pose equity, uh, efficiency trade-offs, structural forms, globalization, austerity. Okay. Now, this uh, inequality doesn't fall from the sky point. Um, you know, this, this is a picture of the most robust um, uh, determinants of inequality. Uh, this is uh, due to work that Davide Fucheri and, and other colleagues and myself have been doing. But it just shows um, that really uh, uh, bread and butter policies and globalization policies are at the heart, are on the same uh, sort of order of importance when we look at the drivers of inequality um, as things like uh, technical change and technical progress. The other thing is the, the you know, we all know, uh, we know about Branko's work and the elephant chart and we know about uh, the fact that uh, uh, big emerging uh, market countries like China and India have gotten a lot richer and the gap between rich and poor in the world is narrowing. But the problem of rising inequalities at the national level is not just a problem of a few countries. It is a pervasive problem uh, throughout the world. Um, and, um, you, know, it, it, you know, there's many different data that you can use, uh, uh, you know, the Gini, the labor share, the top one, ten, whatever you want, but it's, it's, it's a general problem. And, you know, coming back to this thing that it's not about the social welfare function, it's about sustainably being able to grow the pie. And, you know, one of the things that I think puts the fear of God into people um, who want to preserve the status quo um, is that actually the status quo could be deeply threatened by rising inequality because it can fuel uh, 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 the, the voice and the, uh, and the uh, ability to change the political agenda by, by those who favor a more nativist and protectionist kind of agenda. And so this does tie in with uh, recent debates. Um, and again, you know, the, the point is not just to express moral uh, outrage at rising inequality. It's, you know, at the fund, what we have been doing is showing that there is a direct economic cost to rising inequality, and that's what we say in red here. Um, uh, and again, you know, uh, let's not just obsess only about the people who get uh, dislocated as a result of trade. Uh, let's think a little bit about finance. Let's bring finance into the discussion, uh, discussions about uh, globalization uh, because um, there is a lot of literature to, to suggest that trade does make the pie bigger, but the evidence that finance makes the pie bigger is much more tenuous. And so if, if uh, globalization of finance uh, leads to uh, big increases in inequality, 
stacked up against the, the mixed evidence that the pie gets bigger, well, that's, that's a much, that's much more uh, you know, interesting thing to be talking about because the equity efficiency trade-off there is going to be much more adverse. And in fact, it could be even worse than that uh, because um, when, when capital is mobile across countries, um, there is evidence that um, you know, uh, governments will try and keep capital at home by, um, by uh, you know, having lower and lower tax rates. So there's a race to the bottom uh, on taxation. And um, the smaller size of the state, as a result, means that the state is less able to perform its redistributive kinds of functions. So if there's going to be more people who are dislocated and are, who are uh, left uh, in communities that have no, no jobs and no opportunities and no possible no possibility for a dignified life, then, um, then, th then that's a huge problem, right? Because a smaller state uh, 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 in that situation is going to be, uh, find it much more difficult to perform its essential functions. So, um, you know, we, we, we've, uh, we've had a series of papers on this uh, growth and distribution together. I'm not going to have time to go through it all. But this is, you know, just to give you a picture of the data, you know, economists obsess about causality, rightly so, and, and you know, the fact that these are two endogenous variables. But this is just a picture of the data. And it does not suggest, uh, far, far from it, that um, uh, more inequality uh, is, um, is, uh, you know, is, uh, is good for growth, as the, the, the people who, who suggest that you know, inequality is essential for incentives, is essential for uh, people to make efforts. In fact, uh, it, on the left panel, it seems that you know, uh, higher inequality seems to be associated um, uh, with lower growth in the upcoming decade, uh, and that redistribution uh, doesn't seem to have uh, 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 this terrible effect uh, uh, on, on uh, the level of growth. Uh, in fact, if anything, there seems to be a, a, a weak positive relationship. But then, you know, of course, you have to go beyond associations, and this is what I don't have time to, to go, with, uh, go through in detail with you, but this is in a paper that's forthcoming in the Journal of Economic Growth, but it's, it's, a, it's a paper that was released by the fund many years ago, um, uh, and it basically suggests when you, when you do the econometrics as well as you possibly can and you control for as much as you can and you try to, um, uh, you know, really take into account um, uh, the, the possible uh, endogeneity and the two-way relationships between these variables. In fact, what you wind up with is that inequality uh, does, it, is not, does not really have a, a, a sizable direct causal effect on growth. Um, but um, when you redistribute more, um, uh, the, the, the effect of uh, inducing greater equality in the distribution of income is actually exerts a favorable effect on growth. Uh, and so redistribution, far from being antithetical to growth, can actually be a win-win uh, type of policy uh, of a magnitude, I would say, that is, that is not only statistically significant but economically so. You can do the same thing. Uh, yep in terms of growth duration, the, the, the sustainability of growth. And again, what you find is that redistribution uh, can actually help uh, uh, make growth less fragile, can help uh, 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 elongate the duration of growth spells, which is so important for c poor countries to be able to catch up with the frontier. Yes, there is a nonlinearity in the relationship. Um, uh, if you're already doing a lot of redistribution, then doing a bit more uh, it, uh, might, might do some harm. That's in line with sort of economists' views that the, the costs of distortive taxation uh, increase at an increasing rate. They are convex. But, um, but for the majority of countries in the middle of that redistribution distribution, uh, this is not a uh, problem. Structural forms, I've already given you a flavor of the results, but the, the bottom line is that every structural reform that you can think of, to some degree, has effects both on distribution and on the aggregate size of the pie. So please, please, pay attention to these distributional effects as well as the supply-enhancing effects, the aggregate effects, when you design these policies. Because, you know, again, uh, not doing so will undercut uh, the, the very purpose of these policies, which is to durably increase the size of the pie. 
Financial globalization, maybe Davide will talk more about it, but it was a puzzle to us that so much of the debates on globalization has been about trade and finance has been ignored. Um, what we have done is really um, cut the data in various different ways to look at the macro and distributional effects of financial globalization, looking at it with macro data and looking at it with sectoral data, sectoral data being a, a much more efficient and effective way to identify causal mechanisms here. And what we find uh, is that indeed when you open up to foreign capital, uh, the growth effects are fairly meager and that is in line with the voluminous uh, empirical literature on financial globalization going back several decades. But what has not been emphasized in this literature is that the distributional effects are extremely salient. Uh, and you can, you, this result is so robust, it's, it's hard to imagine something that is more robust. It's it, robust for possible reverse causality. Uh, it's robust for, for um, a growth expectations effect. It's robust uh, to uh, using an instrumental variables approach. And um, we, the other thing we know is that the, the sort of effect of financial opening does depend on sort of the kinds of financial institutions that you have domestically. Um, you know, if you have a more inclusive financial system, a better regulated financial system, that is going to affect the ultimate uh, aggregate and distributional effects. We find, we find support for the importance of these institutional challenges and also on how much money actually does slosh across your, for, uh, your borders. It's not just about the regulations, it's about the money that actually comes in. Uh, more money, more propensity to experience these boom and bust cycles. This is a picture from an AER paper that we had a couple of years ago. Again, sectorally, same kinds of stories. We have many different identification strategies uh, in terms of the degree of external financial dependence, in terms of um, the natural propensity to lay off uh, workers uh, when, you, when the cost of capital drops and you open up in terms of the, uh, the sectoral elasticities of substitution. Again, the story is the same. Uh, uh, you know, aggregate effects are meager, but the distributional effects are, are indeed quite salient. Again, you know, some, of these, some of these kinds of effects could be due to domestic financial deregulation as well as, um, as, well as external financial liberalization. But again, if we control for these other kinds of structural forms, the results stand up. And again, this point that, you know, this is particularly problematic if there is a commitment on the part of policymakers to say, yeah, we are going to globalize, but we're going to look after those who, left behind, who are left behind, but it may be much more difficult for them to do so because the, the state, you know, there's this race to the bottom in, in taxes. Um, of course, it's not all bleak. If you, can, if you can improve financial inclusion, if you can improve the quality of regulation and supervision of your, of your financial sector, you can have a less bumpy ride. And of course, if you can, if you can prevent crises from occurring in the, in, the, um, in the first place. I'm going to skip fiscal consolidation. The only thing I want to say is there has been too much obsession about public debt in countries uh, that have a fair bit to ample fiscal space. So one of the messages is let us not overdo it on the virtues of fiscal consolidation. Uh, not only uh, for the distributional effects but also because actually the efficiency benefits of ever lower public debt are, are, are hard to see. Um, last slide. High inequality and low and fragile growth are two sides of the same coin. A dangerous gamble to go for growth and assume equity will take care of itself. It will not. Fear of using fiscal redistribution is overblown. In fact, on average in the data, redistribution is a pro-growth policy through the greater equality it engenders. The leak in Arthur Oaken's bucket, you remember he wrote a famous book several decades ago, has not been that large in practice. The evidence on financial globalization, costs in terms of increased volatility are high. Output benefits are elusive and shared unevenly. Other effects are raised to the bottom on taxes, question mark, reduce scope for redistribution uh, and the role for the state more generally. Be cognizant of growth equity trade-offs in both macro and structural policies. Think of this at the design uh, stage when you are designing these policies. Uh, think of using complementary policies, trampoline policies, so that we can make people whole and actually genuinely live up to the pledges that we have made. Um, and, and don't be afraid of redistribution at the end of the day. Uh, on macro, 
let's not overdo it on public debt obsession. Thanks. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. That, I think, uh, sets us off in a great um, direction. Uh, I think a lot of what's going to follow um, fills in aspects of, of this sort of broad overview that, that Jonathan um, uh, laid out for us. So I'm going to ask Chris to start, and I'm going to be even more ruthless because these are sort of 10-minute presentations, roughly speaking. Okay? Okay. So I will wave at you with a couple of minutes to yeah. go. So the floor okay. is Thank you very much. I have 10 minutes. So um, I'd like uh, to take my turn to thank Chris and the organizing committee for this opportunity to present some of the new work at the fund on structural issues and on issues uh, related to low-income countries. Um, I, I would like to take two minutes to um, recognize the work we are doing with DFIT, uh, which has been fundamental for uh, deepening what we have been doing, especially on policy research. Uh, this is a long-standing relationship going back to uh, eight years. I have to say that much of the work we are doing, much of the work you will see here today uh, would not exist or, or at least would not be of the same depth if it were not for the DFIT uh, collaboration. As you know, many of the work that you are doing on low-income countries suffer from uh, data constraints but also methods uh, constraints, and these are the kind of uh, gaps that we are trying uh, to fill jointly. Um, and, and I'm saying this not only in trying to build uh, good papers, but also in conducting good policy at the fund and, uh, and, and beyond. So we see a lot of uptake of our uh, analytical work from authorities, and, and this is exactly why we do uh, the research. So uh, what I'll do here is to turn a bit to a, a different issue um, than what Jonathan focused on. I will focus on our work on structural uh, reforms. And you may have not heard that uh, the fund has been turning attention to this issue. It's actually over the last 10 years that we have turned attention, but now it's becoming more about the center, uh, both of policy research and uh, operations. So what we have done a few years back, maybe five years back, we went and uh, talked to policymakers, and we asked them what would be their key challenges in formulating structural uh, reform advice. And uh, basically 88% of the respondents said that uh, data constraints is what limits them for uh, thinking of formulating structural reforms. There were other issues like whether these issues are uh, feeding the mandate of the fund or whether there is a conceptual uh, framework to follow or even some of the policies that would, co would come out of this work uh, would be controversial. But the key aspect, what we took from that survey a long time ago, was that was the data constraint. So we ventured in actually about three years ago to start a major project, again with the help of uh, DFIT uh, support, uh, to construct the most comprehensive data set uh, in existence related to structural reforms. And you may know that there are um, very nice indices for advanced economies. For example, OECD puts out a fantastic database uh, on structural reforms, but that's limited only to advanced economies, OECD countries. Very little exists in terms of developing and low-income countries. Now, it took us three years to get here. It took us a lot of work. Uh, simply, as you see the second bullet there, we had to develop these indices by looking and recording, uh, 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 extracting uh, parts of, stru of, of uh, IMF reports, which of course takes a lot of time and a lot of uh, RA effort. So what we managed to almost come up with, we are not done yet, we, we hope to have the final data set by the end of this year or maybe early next year, is a comprehensive data set that uh, includes a lot of uh, low income and uh, emerging markets all together, including advanced economies, we have a balanced panel of nine countries. For many of these reforms, uh, we go up to 140 countries. For a very, very long period, from 1973 to 2014, again, for many countries, it goes up to 2016, and, and for various types of, of reforms. So we, have, we cover both financial reforms, both from the banking side, but also the external uh, financial reforms in terms of capital account liberalization, and the real side, which includes trade reforms, 
but also uh, product markets and uh, labor markets as well. By the way, the labor markets is a true innovation. There is very little in the literature. Um, this is, this is uh, a true innovation, and uh, David has done most of that work. So what, I, I have very little time to show what we get and how we plan to use this data, so bear with me for a couple of minutes, and if you have further questions, we can take them uh, later on. So I start by showing you, start from the very big picture. So once we plot, and this is only for one year, 2014, um, all of these different types of um, reforms in this spider, spider wedge type uh, diagram where the center uh, signifies the most liberalized that you can be, so the very center. What you see is what you expect is the blue line, uh, the blue line shows advanced economies, the red line shows emerging markets, and the, uh, the, the green line shows low income countries. You, 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 you get what you expect that uh, advanced economies are the most liberalized, next emerging markets, and then low income countries. This can give you a bit more on the magnitude. So for example, we see that on capital account liberalization, um, low income countries are far behind. The same is also true in terms of products. What is surprising, was surprising to us as well, we make a big deal out of labor reforms. In fact, labor flexibility is not far behind in low-income countries as opposed to emerging and advanced economies. Now, I wanna start zooming in in what's kind of more interesting. And here I wanna show you a couple of plots that we've done uh, for you in terms of showing um, different indices across the development path, across uh, per capita GDP. For example, here is one, which is what you would expect, the level of liberalization in trade, um, which shows a positive relationship. Yeah, most of the advanced economies are more, um, use less tariffs, and most of the low-income countries use more tariffs. What I want you to focus as we go along in these pictures is the level of heterogeneity within these groups. So for example, as we go to financial reforms, basically these are banking reforms, you see enormous heterogeneity among the low-income countries in green, but also the emerging markets as well. Moving on to capital account uh, index, look at Uganda, of fully liberalized at uh, an index of uh, taking a value of one, and then Mozambique, very not liberalized almost at all. And also compare leaks with emerging markets. Many times we make this distinction between you know, leaks and emerging markets. As time goes by, it's clear that you know, the difference between at least the high-end leaks and the low-end EMs is not much, and it shows in this uh, picture. Lots of heterogeneity, and not very big difference between the low-income countries and, and, and the emerging markets. And here is our surprising result also, something that we have to investigate further. In terms of labor reforms, there is not much difference between flexibility in low-income emerging markets and even adva advanced economies. Notice in advanced economies there is a lot more heterogeneity on labor reforms than other uh, reforms. For example, here on capital account, sorry, on capital account, but also on financial regulation and trade, you know, all of these blue um, uh, circles are very well tied uh, together. Okay, so you may say this is all interesting, but it's a little boring because it's all at the cross-country level. Our attempt is actually to zoom into uh, country-specific uh, work, and uh, both in terms of research, but also in our advice to our member countries. Now, uh, what, what we eventually would like to do is to look at country by country, to look at growth TFP measures, and to associate this with structural reforms of all the types that I, I talked about. Now, you may say this is easy to obtain for Australia, coming from the OECD database, but what you could not obtain before our database is uh, this nice plot for Malaysia, which shows the different generations of reforms in the country and the different kind of reforms, yes, um, across time. Or Tanzania, which is very close to our discussion's heart, which, uh, uh, as we can identify here, went through two different waves, one uh, with trade liberalization in agriculture in uh, 1980s, mid-1980s, and then later on uh, with the banking reform and industrial regulations reform, which we think is somehow linked to the productivity increase. It would be interesting to hear from Governor Dulu what happened to productivity in Tanzania from 2007 onwards, which we see a slowdown, 
And we hope that with our reforms, we can say something about whether this is attributed to some of the slowdown of these uh, structural reforms. I wanted to finish with what we wanted to do in terms of research. First, we wanted to conceptualize. We wanted to see whether we can, um, you know, there is this big literature about sequencing and waves of reforms. Um, whether reforms happen one at a time or whether they happen in uh, packages. And we hope, and again, this is a conceptual structure, we hope with all of these different indices that we put together to come up to some conclusion about um, sequencing, uh, waves, packaging. One uh, last thing, and I'll finish, uh, Chris. We are even more ambitious, at least we would like to be more ambitious. You know all about this uh, issue of structural transformation, the story that goes, uh, that development basically follows agriculture, manufacturing services in that order. Um, we would like uh, ultimately to link this to diversification. We know that there is the parallel story that countries early on diversify and then they specialize, they reconcentrate. This is of course along the development path and then we would like to see how our reforms can, uh, be, can, um, can relate to these three different uh, processes. Is there any way by which we can explain what is happening or even bring these processes together when we look at uh, structural reforms, uh, the structural reform index that we are developing? A lot of things that we are planning to do with this, right? A lot of papers, but I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you also for being very disciplined on time. It is uh, uh, very much appreciated. It gives, it gives us plenty of space for discussion. So, number three. Thank you, Chris. So thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, the focus of this presentation uh, uh, will, uh, uh, you know, Jonathan uh, introduced uh, the fact that uh, the fund is caring more about uh, uh, growth, uh, inequality trade-off, and that the structural reform uh, and general structural transformation can play an important role. Uh, what I'm trying to look in this presentation is uh, what about demand policy? So this is our, uh, uh, really the, the breadth and butter of the fund. So what is the effect of monetary policies on distribution? Uh, what is the effect of uh, fiscal austerity or fiscal consolidation or redistribution? Um, the usual disclaimer applies, and I'd also like to say that this is a, a joint work with uh, many colleagues at the fund, uh, Giovanni Medina, which is here, uh, Junji, Prakash Rungani, Alexandra Cinska. Uh, Let's start with uh, monetary policies. Uh, should we expect that monetary policies affect inequalities in one way or another? Well, uh, from a theoretical point of view, uh, this issue uh, is, uh, is quite ambiguous in the sense that um, if you think about an expansion of monetary policy, uh, this could uh, uh, theoretically still have both uh, a positive effect or a negative effect on inequality. Uh, what some of the um, commentators of the uh, recent years following the uh, several accommodated monetary policy uh, framework in many advanced economies, actively we argue that uh, uh, the action of the Fed or the ECB or uh, the Bank of, Bank of England and the other central banks uh, have tended to uh, increase inequality. Uh, why they argue so? Because uh, uh, of two main effects. The fact is that uh, uh, this uh, monetary policy is in uh, as uh, increase uh, uh, asset price. And since uh, uh, a larger share of household that tends to be already richer uh, holds this asset, uh, this monetary policy easing has basically benefited more uh, richer household than poorer household. A second argument is that uh, is typically linked with the effect of inflation on price stabilities and inequality is that uh, when you do expansionary monetary policies, basically you tend to create inflations. Uh, and since uh, uh, typically uh, poorer households detain a larger share of liquid assets, so basically uh, an expansion of monetary policy by increasing inflation is going to reduce the purchasing power uh, of, of uh, poorer households more than uh, the purchasing power of uh, richer households. Uh, however, uh, others uh, academics, in including uh, uh, Draghi from the European Central Bank, actually have argued that uh, most of the monetary policy action that, for example, the ECB or the Fed have taken uh, were actually supporting not only demand, but also were helping to reduce inequality. And basically, the argument were twofold. The first is that uh, basically any unexpected uh, uh, decline uh, in the interest rate is going to uh, benefit borrower, 
uh, at the cost of, of savers. And since uh, typically uh, poorer households are uh, more borrowers than, uh, uh, than savers, so actually an unexpected change, let's say, in the policy rate is going to uh, reduce inequality. But uh, the main point uh, uh, in the Draghi speech uh, was indeed that uh, by boosting demand, so by uh, avoiding that uh, demand would collapse, uh, actually the central banks was uh, uh, mostly uh, trying to protect the poor, in the sense that uh, uh, stronger demand will li lift up economic condition for everybody, uh, but since typically a poorer household are more uh, sensitive to demand fluctuations, so actually the, the, the operator of the central banks uh, was going to uh, reduce inequality and not to increase it. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, many, many countries, uh, uh, this issue about uh, the action of central banks has raised uh, uh, a lot of questions also from a political point of view in the sense that uh, one proponent uh, of the others were trying to uh, push a bit their political agenda and try to interfere with the, um, the central bank's uh, operations. Uh, from an empirical point of view, the, the research is quite scant. Uh, the only uh, paper uh, that uh, provides really convincing evidence, at least for the US, is the paper by uh, Kobion, Krojicenko, and uh, Silva, where actually they find that uh, using uh, so-called exogenous monetary policy shock, a la Roman and Romer, uh, monetary policy, expansion of monetary policies in the US, uh, as uh, anything equal, uh, actually reduce inequality. Uh, following this work, there has been uh, a couple of work uh, uh, done by the OECD, uh, done by people at the Dutch Bank, uh, or the people that are the Bank of Japan, that have typically looked at uh, uh, the experience of single countries. Uh, and uh, if you look at the experience for uh, uh, Germany, the effect was a bit mixed, uh, the same for Japan, and uh, some people have looked at a uh, broader sample of advanced economies, but again, the effect has been uh, rather mixed. What we argue in this work is that um, one of the reasons why, uh, especially the last three papers, didn't find a bit of mixed evidence uh, is because they were not able to identify shocks, monetary policy shocks that would be deemed exogenous. And this, uh, as I will show you later in my presentation, will play uh, a key role in explaining what, effect, what are the effects of monetary policy inequality. So our contribution of this work uh, is, uh, is uh, twofold. The first is that uh, uh, to, to the best of our knowledge, we are the first to construct uh, uh, exogenous monetary policy shocks uh, for a large set of advanced and emerging market economies. So for about 35 countries, uh, we identify shocks, monetary policy shocks that can be exogenous uh, and therefore can really capture the effect uh, of monetary policy action on uh, economic activity as well uh, as on inequality. Uh, the second is a uh, uh, look at the, the effect of these monetary policy shocks, not only at economic activity, but also distributions, sorry, and uh, try to understand whether uh, uh, there are factors that affect uh, this is distributional consequence, uh, both related in terms of the size and the signs of the shocks, uh, related to whether this effect has changed over time depending on economic conditions, like for example, if this effect has been typically larger in recession or in expansions, and also try to, to look at uh, what uh, can explain cross countries' difference uh, in the effect of monetary policy actions on inequality. Uh, let me just give you a summary of the key findings in case uh, uh, Chris will cut me up. Uh, the first is that uh, basically our evidence is in line with evidence for the US uh, in the sense that uh, contraction in monetary policies tends to increase inequality, uh, while uh, expansion in monetary policies uh, is going to reduce inequality. So the main channel is, the, is indeed the true uh, higher demand. I will show you later. Uh, the Fed uh, uh, tends to be larger for positive shocks, so for contraction than uh, for expansions. This is basically in line with the, uh, the literature on uh, the effect of monetary policies uh, on economic conditions in many countries. Uh, and the various across countries, uh, uh, mostly in terms of two dimensions. The third dimension is uh, really a country characteristics. Since labor income plays a, a particular role in uh, determining the strengths and the signs of the relation between monetary policy shocks and inequality, uh, what we find is that uh, these effects, uh, on average, tend to be larger in countries with a higher labor share of income. Uh, and the second, uh, it's a bit what uh, Jonathan says, that uh, redistribution policies uh, can help uh, in some sense uh, when uh, uh, central banks uh, uh, increase the policy rate, uh, 
uh, this will uh, increase inequality, but uh, the threat will be smaller in countries where there is more redistribution, or actually there is uh, more redistributions. So let me go through uh, the identification of these shocks. Uh, soon these shocks for anybody will be, um, this paper is, go is going to be published soon, so any anyone that would like to use these uh, monetary policy shocks is uh, feel free to use it. So how do we identify these uh, uh, shocks that we, we will claim to be exogenous? Uh, what we do is uh, we look at an expected change in the policy rate, uh, so basically the difference between the observed policy rate and what uh, could be uh, anticipated by economists or the forecast. And then what we do is uh, we purge this innovation in the policy rate by similar types of innovations in, uh, in the growth rate of output, so in economic activity, as well as uh, uh, innovation in inflation, regarding news in inflation. Um, this approach has several advantages, uh, and uh, we claim that, uh, and we show indeed that they are quite exogenous. Um, this is a distribution, for example, for advanced and emerging market economies. You see that are more or less normally distributed. Um, if we compare our methodology with the, the, basically the baseline of uh, exogenous monetary policy shocks that exist, is the Roman and Roman shocks, you see that the correlation of our shocks and the one with from the US is extremely high. And the shocks usually um, have effects that are standard in the legion, so in terms of effect of output, effects on employment, and an effect on, uh, on the price level. So key question, what, what is the impact of these shocks in inequality? And, uh, what we do, we trace out the, the evolution and quality following these shocks. So basically what you see is that following a, a one basis point increase and the exogenous increase in the monetary policy rate, inequality increase, and this effect is both uh, statistically and economically significant. Uh, you, you see a similar effect if you look at the other measure distribution, such as the top 10% of income, the top 5% of income, the top 1%. And if uh, uh, you look at uh, other, other labor share. Uh, let me just go over, uh, I just already the key finding, uh, one other work, uh, we'll just uh, quickly summarize, I think, what Giovanni has presented today, what about fiscal policy? So there has been a research looking at the effect of fiscal austerities on inequality for advanced economies, but so far very little uh, about the effect on, on developing economies. So in this work, uh, basically, we do two, two main contributions. The first is uh, uh, we identify uh, exogenous fiscal policy shocks uh, using uh, a similar approach to the one that uh, I presented for monetary policies. We do this for 103 countries, so it's a very large set of uh, uh, exogenous shocks starting from the early 90s up to now. Basically what we do is we examine the effect of different types of uh, fiscal policy actions in terms of expenditure, in terms of consumption, in terms of investment. And we compute uh, and define a measure of inequality multipliers. And our evidence compared to some previous uh, uh, research is that uh, fiscal austerity is, uh, is harmful for inequality, not only for advanced economies, but also for developing economies. And again, the magnitude of this effect is, is quite large. So if I conclude uh, a bit uh, with a high policy conclusion, Jonathan has shown that uh, most of the structural reform that you may think of, they typically tends to have uh, uh, trade-off between uh, efficiency and uh, equity. Uh, interesting, uh, if you look at demand policies, it seems that there is no bit rid of, in the sense that uh, uh, both policies that tend to boost demand, they actually tend to reduce inequality. And I will stop here and give the floor to Stefano. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So last but certainly not least in this first pass-through, uh, Stefano is going to, I think, both broaden, possibly broaden the agenda a little bit and talk about some more of the aspects of the uh, fund's work. Thank you, Chris. Um, as um, Chris mentioned, I'm not from the research department. I'm from the uh, policy and strategy and review department. So in our department, we look more at policies and uh, how the policy goes through, pass through uh, countries and our discussion with country levels. Uh, so uh, before going, uh, so today I would like to um, present the IMF policy and operational work in the area of inequality and gender. Uh, before going uh, to our engagement with country directly, I would just uh, summarize what uh, basically has been said uh, in terms of why the, the, the IMF focus on inequality and, and gender on these topics. 
Well, um, we focus because it's macro critical, and that means because its inequality is it's important for the sustainability and the, and the growth of the pie, right? So uh, this uh, basically um, show this slide is the essence of what uh, research in the IMF and in the and from others have shown that inequality uh, it's it's um, really uh, critical for growth and stability. Uh, in addition, uh, we have very importantly that, as my colleagues have mentioned before, uh, conventional policy and reforms for growth can have detrimental effects on the distributional effects. So it's very important to focus on the design of policy and on the uh, mitigating factors. Um, and last but not least, because there is a growing interest from our membership and other stakeholders for the fund to focus on, on these issues. Uh, similarly, on uh, gender, we, we know that women empowerment, it's important uh, directly on output, just because it increases the labor force, but also on productivity, because of diversity, including gender diversity, it uh, uh, brings new ideas, new, uh, uh, new innovative um, innovation to, uh, that affect productivity. Also, uh, our work show that there is a relation between uh, increased female labor force and uh, uh, export diversification which in developing countries, which is uh, very important for economic resilience. Finally, uh, there is clear relation between uh, gender inequality and income inequality, and as we say, it's all boiled down to growth and stability. Uh, so moving to our engagement with, uh, with country, the IMF engaged with three main um, stream of work. One is uh, the analytical and policy work. Then we have the policy advice, through our consultations, where we got surveillance with countries and then program work. Uh, when we have the lending that is associated with a restructuring of a program for, um, uh, for the, the, the re-established um, stability, macroeconomic stability in the country. And the third work stream is through capacity development. We provide technical assistance, we provide um, capacity building in terms of training and workshop, et cetera. So moving quickly, we have heard already uh, in the area of inequality work done um, by the fund, and this is really, this work, analytical and policy work, is the, uh, really the, the, the block base that for backing our, the feeds into our bilateral uh, policy advice. And uh, here are just some samples of the analytical and policy work in the area of financial inclusion. Uh, we have this book uh, done a couple of years ago on inequality and fiscal policy. Uh, fiscal policy, we know, is one of the main instruments for redistribution. It goes into the nitty gritty of spending and tax measures. Our last fiscal monitor in October was dedicated to inequality. And then I would like to highlight this. Um, this paper here, which has been um, uh, really done with the support of DFIT, and this paper summarizes <coughs> the work that we've done at the country level. It's like taking stock of uh, country work that we have done in a number of um, developing uh, countries uh, where we analyze the impact of policy and reform, consider pro-growth and stability, the uh, distributional implications of, of, the, um, of those reforms. Uh, and we learn lessons and see how policy can be uh, designed differently to uh, take into account uh, the distributional effect and policy to mitigate those. In the area of uh, gender, again, here are some um, major papers that we have done where we focus on labor force participation, on the uh, uh, wage gap, and here again, the work that's been done in the last two years, this is just one of the papers <laughs> done that is on gender budgeting, and this is really uh, being conducted with the support of DFIT. 
and uh, there is a book that is now in printing where we um, we uh, like um, analyze the experience in 80 countries on gender budgeting, not only in developing countries, but also in other parts of the world. And there is an analysis in 23, in depth in 23 countries. Uh, uh, again, uh, going to the policy advice, how this fit into our work at the country level. Uh, we, in 2015, on the, at the time of the Financing for Development, the fund committed to deepen its work and to get a systematic approach uh, in operationalizing this work in inequality and gender. Uh, here, so we, we decided to go for a pilot uh, approach uh, in, both, uh, in both areas and uh, to understand how to, to serve better our membership, because in a sense it was also for us a learning experience. So uh, moving to uh, this, I just uh, uh, would like to show, we have done two, in, two waves of, um, of pilots that have been completed, and the third is uh, ongoing. We have done uh, about uh, 35 countries on inequality, and there are like seven ongoing. And uh, for gender, we have completed 38 countries. These are all published. They are in Article 4, um, in Article 4, uh, being discussed with the authority and be fed the recommendation and the policy recommendations uh, of the fund. And uh, in um, these cover a variety of issues, depending really on the country situation, circumstances, the interest of the authority, the reform they are embarking. So, and we know that inequality, and then it's in particular, it's, you know, many facets. Um, just to focus uh, a bit um, on the work on, that we've done with DFIT, we have uh, developed a methodological approach uh, to analyze the impact of reform. These are based, have uh, been applied on 70 countries, and they are uh, based on a dynamic general equilibrium model with heterogeneous agents. These models allowed us to analyze the impact of reforms on both the macro and the distributional impact at the same time. Um, I don't have much time to go through it. This is one of the cases that we have applied these models. Malawi, that and Malawi undertook um, a subsidy reform uh, to agricultural inputs. This was a program introduced years back that uh, was meant to, um, to um, secure for food security and reduce poverty of farmers. And it just blew up in terms of cost. It became like 3% of GDP, and it de didn't really address uh, its goals. So the remover, the, the team analyzed what would be implied, the implication of removing the, um, the, the subsidies. And we see here that would have a positive effect on real GDP through the allocation of resources, but would, be, uh, would have a detrimental effect on the, on, the, um, on the social indicators. And this is because these really act like transfer directly to poor farmers. So the team analyzed what would imply to increase the productivity in a more sustainable way of, um, of uh, the, the farmers through um, increase in spending in R&D, in agriculture, and, uh, and also including cash transfer for more short-term relief uh, and mitigation of, uh, of the reform. So, and these are the results. Um, here is an example of the work done on gender budgeting in Rwanda, which is a sort of model country for uh, the practice in gender budgeting. And uh, we see that they have um, done uh, several programs in education, and uh, they have really uh, improved the enrollment uh, over the years, uh, in particular in secondary and tertiary. Uh, so in the last area, the capacity development, um, as I said, we do TA training. Uh, in terms of the work done with DFIT, we have developed courses inside the fund, because it's very important that our teams know that all that is available to, uh, to them, the tools and the instrument, but also we do peer learning event in gender. We have done one in, uh, one in Rwanda and two weeks ago in Mauritius. 
And uh, we also have developed toolkits, this macro distribution model. Uh, we have done it uh, a toolkit that is really uh, available and can be uh, very user friendly. And uh, um, so in terms of future work where we are going, once it's finished, the, uh, this third wave of pilots, we are uh, planning, the fund is uh, make the decision to uh, analyze the issues in all countries that is considered macro critical. Um, and uh, in this context, we have produced internally on how to do notes that are available to all teams, um, analyzing how to approach the issues and the tools available. We have a dedicated internet site with all the information. In terms of going, we are developing in particular this model. We are now introducing the gender aspect, so the model will be able to also uh, analyze uh, the impact of reforms on, on gender, labor force participation and wage gap. And we have done one, one work on Argentina that's been published and there are other three underway. Uh, and, uh, and we are going to increase our uh, training and, and workshop. And this is it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for uh, great contributions and also, I have to say, for, for being very disciplined with time. This gives us plenty of time for, for open discussion. It's my great pleasure to invite Benno Ndulu to um, lead off with some general remarks on, on these presentations. Um, and Benno, let me invite you to take the, um, uh, the podium. And while you're getting yourself... Settle, let me just say it's a great pleasure to have, have Benno here at the CSAE conference again. He's probably very well known to many, if not all of you. Um, he's recently ended uh, a 10-year spell as governor of the Bank of Tanzania and has, has returned to his spiritual home, the University of Dar es Salaam, um, as the, uh, I hope I get this right, the um, Nyerere Professor of, of Development, International Development at the university, but he's also, uh, to our great pleasure, a, a visiting fellow here uh, in Oxford at the moment as one of the co-directors of the uh, Pathways to Prosperity Commission on Technology and Development. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Benno here as our, as our discussant, and uh, I'll leave the floor to you. Well, thank you. Um, again, it was really good listening to the panelists. And the first question I would ask them, are you sure you are from the fund? <laughs> <laughs> this is typically, um, I think, what you would probably get from most of us who are working as uh, uh, policy makers and listening to Jonathan. I think my job would have been much easier uh, for the last 10 years. But let me uh, <laughs> let me make just a few um, uh, comments uh, in ten minutes. Uh, my comments will be made from two perspectives. Um, one is alignment of the fund research that we just listened to to now I think almost uh, a central concern globally uh, about inclusion. Uh, and inclusion from two perspectives as an end, uh, meaning leave no one behind, uh, and also as a means to an end, which means uh, making inclusion, uh, inclusion as a means to more rapid growth and to better development from both those uh, perspectives. Um, <coughs> The second perspective that I, I'll uh, uh, look at uh, this research is alignment to the core mandate of the fund. Uh, I can't uh, stay away from that, be, having been a policy maker. And the real question is, uh, how do you translate uh, a good bit of this into policy advice that's consistent with the uh, the findings and the type um, uh, of research. 
So let me start with the first. What is significant about the research we just had? Um, I think uh, the significance is at two levels. One, it is the fact that this research is being done in the fund. It shortens the distance between knowledge and policy advice. And we know there has been quite a good bit of work done on uh, uh, inequality and, and growth. Uh, some of that work had already started moving in the direction of your findings. Uh, uh, and if you look at uh, work that Nancy Bedsell and uh, you know, Alwalia and Ravi Kanbur and my good friend here, uh, Augustine Fosu, we will honor uh, later. Um, we were already moving in the direction of uh, worrying about inequality being actually um, a hindrance, a potential hindrance. Um, and even Barrow, in the 2000 paper that he did, everybody quotes, uh, at least in partitioning the countries, uh, for all countries that uh, have a GDP per capita less than 2000, he made a very clear statement that inequality actually was working uh, against uh, growth. So we started moving in that direction. So I think the fact that this work now has found a home within the fund, uh, where I think the preoccupation had been on macro stability and dealing with uh, cycles and managing shocks, I think uh, it's a very, very uh, important um, development. But it's not only that. Uh, in relation to this first um, uh, perspective. It is also true that uh, the finding which probably caught my attention more is the one on redistribution is actually good for growth. Because, you know, you may find yourself in a situation where you are actually having growth that goes with rising inequality. It may happen in a number of our countries where dualism is still uh, a major sort of uh, 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 fact of the day. Uh, it's not to be like Kuznets, but it's something close to that, that as you move jobs from rural area into the manufacturing and urban areas, something like rising inequality may actually happen. But whether you can do something as a corrective measure or not, that I think had been part of the biggest hindrance that we had in terms of being able to uh, connect with uh, policy advice that uh, uh, had uh, been. And I think it is, it is good to see that uh, the work that is being done now on cash transfers uh, and other redistributive um, uh, uh, interventions, uh, also on uh, education, uh, particularly basic education, uh, which itself also tends to be helpful uh, in terms of uh, further reducing inequality uh, is actually being taken to be a positive intervention. So I think I would underline in particular the second finding that redistribution uh, sort of direct and indirect uh, effects of redistribution tends to support growth and it is an economically significant finding, as uh, you actually uh, did, uh, did make clear. Um, now, 
the second perspective, that is of connecting to policy advice, I think first there is an institutional issue that may have to be dealt with. Uh, I worked in the World Bank, I served as a research manager and the bank's research administrator for three years. Um, I could hear the language of the research department and I could hear the language of operational department. <coughs> Two different languages. Uh, and the question is how to get this knowledge and findings percolate to operations. Uh, it's heartening to see at least somebody from SPR who is closer uh, to that operational side also uh, being convinced along the same lines. Uh, and it is, I think, probably one of the key challenges to see how this uh, sort of moves smoothly into, into that um, uh, uh, sphere, because ultimately policy advice is given under the operational uh, wing. Now, there are two um, more specific findings I will conclude with uh, that I think is music to my ears. One is austerity can be costly, which was very clear, I think, um, uh, and I have never understood why that was not understood to be such. Uh, partly because, particularly, when you have a reversible shock, you know you can finance your way out of it. And yet, the advice you get is to be austere so that you can close the resource gap. It didn't make any sense. Because that's pro-cyclical. And fortunately, nowadays, counter-cyclicality has been accepted. I hear that more when we engage with the teams that come on policy advice. So it's not only that austerity can be costly, austerity, particularly during the time of shocks, can be actually destructive. And it does stop the process of investment and it means picking up afresh once you are out of that and this means mark timing in terms of uh, uh, development. And lastly, is paying down debt rapidly. And a good number of our countries now, uh, post-crisis, having run down on uh, our accumulation uh, of space, um, are all being seriously urged to do fiscal consolidation, which is okay. Uh, but when it comes to debt, I found the point you make extremely sensible. That you can live with debt as long as you are maintaining a growing environment. Because the ratio of debt to GDP will keep on going down and remains sustainable. Rather than trying, and a number of countries, if they try to do that now, it would be so heroic that they would actually destroy themselves. So it's good to hear that this is part of the advice that comes from this, and I hope. Uh, I had the pleasure of interacting <laughs> with, uh, with Chris uh, when occasionally he was coming as part of the the mission team. So, uh, and I'm really glad to see that uh, you were part of this messaging. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Beno. I think that was um, 
really interesting set of comments, but also ending on a very positive note, I think. Um, we've got about 15 minutes or so, slightly more. Um, I would like to open it up for, uh, for discussion. Um, there are some roving mics, so please wait until the mic uh, comes to you. And um, we don't have much time for big statements, so if you can keep your, your questions reasonably concise, that would be appreciated. And if the question is specific to anybody who's spoken, please, please say who you're directing your, um, your comments to. So I'm going to start up in the far corner here. I'm going to go one, two, three, four. And I'm going to take those four, and then I'll, I'll have another round. Okay? So. Uh, thank you. I'm Toba from uh, uh, Purdue University. My question goes to Jonathan. Uh, you know, this is news. I've been read Stiglitz and uh, 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 some of the scathing remarks made about IMF in his book with globalization and its discontent. So my, my question then is, uh, will the bank, judging by uh, your recent studies, will the bank, or the fund, I should say, will the fund now uh, be humble enough to apologize to these countries, having been misled <laughs> by these so-called uh, uh, bread and butter policies that were made over the past 30 years? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> you don't have to answer straight away. And then coming down here, yes, number two. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I have one question for Jonathan and another one for Chris Papayas. So I, I like the way Jonathan forcefully argues for pursuing growth and distributional policies. And, um, so I, I've, uh, and you, pay, you gave a lot of um, attention to financial globalization. And I've been following some of the recent Article 4 documents. Uh, and it seems to me that th there's still more bias towards market fundamentalism. Uh, and you, like you rightly said, I mean, these are mostly race to the bottom type policies, lower your taxes, um, reduce regulation, reduce public wages. So I was wondering if you, if you could give us like specific examples of this kind of um, policies that can target, you know, growth in the supply side and distribution, although increasing the pie and uh, evenly distributing the pie across. If we could get some specific examples, especially in the context of financial globalization, which you focus on. And, and for Chris, um, I, I like this data set you're constructing. I mean, I'm excited about it because it means we can do a lot of work with it. And I was just thinking, is there one macro critical um, structural um, aspect you're missing? I, I'm thinking about um, environmental regulation. Uh, could, I mean, I'm thinking if a firm in, in Europe, for example, has to deal with 20 different uh, environmental regulations and another one in Africa or in, in, in America has to deal with five, uh, that, that may, that's, uh, in my opinion, is a structural um, thing that may be interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Marcus? Uh, Marcus Hacker, Harvard School of Public Health. Um, one of the main strands of uh, the empirics of growth over the last two decades has been the work on institutions and growth and long-term de determinants of growth. And some of these uh, determinants of growth, for example, resource extraction, in turn uh, are tightly linked with inequality. And I had much more confidence in the robustness of the results you sketched and also in, the, in terms of the inter policy interpretations if you embedded... Uh, uh, <coughs> your research, your, your, the presentation of your, your research in this broader academic context. Thank you. And then the last one in this round, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Michael Beeney, University of Nottingham. Um, I apologize to the presenters for not having read any of the papers they cited, but judge, just reacting to their presentation, it occurred to me that if you're looking at, say, at the effect of a monetary policy shock, isn't there a kind of a cyclical component and a structural component, or a same of a fiscal consolidation? So there could be a cyclical pattern to inequality, and that one, one would want to look at the effect of policies in a kind of cyclic, cyclically adjusted manner. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the presenters to respond to that first round, and then I will take a second round of. of questions after that. So Jonathan, perhaps you want to start? Okay. Um, thank you. I, 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 want to, uh, I want to thank Governor uh, Ndulu for his, his comments as well. Um, since I think they're related to some of the questions, maybe, maybe 
uh, and I'm going to be very brief. Um, the message, uh, the first message that you that you talked about was the the redistribution being possibly a win-win policy, and that is indeed a message through the protective effect it, it gives on equality. I, I, I would want to twin that with another message, which is really it's, it's, the message is uh, we need to focus on pre-distribution, uh, the in-market rules of the game, and redistribution, all three things. Um, so you, you mentioned, I think, education. That's a pre-distribution policy. So, so when I talked about designing things right from the get-go, that's about pre-distribution and, and how the rules of the game of the different players in the market. That's in-market stuff and then redistribution. So all three. You know, the business about the gap between thinking and operations, I, that, is a, that is a comment that we, that we get. It's also related to the, to the point of the first speaker in the audience. I, I accept that, but I don't really know what it means. So I don't know. So, you know, I have worked on country teams around the world, been in the field, uh, but I, I don't really know what it means to say, uh, to comment on this gap in the sense that, you know, when you're a country team trying to make the numbers add up, how do you do it and how does this thinking, I think it's a good question, but I don't have the answer. I, 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 I don't know, I don't have the answer. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, you were right to pick up on the austerity can be costly. Um, I guess what you were saying and, and what, what I was saying was this idea of expansionary consolidation uh, really doesn't have uh, strong legs except in some very, very peculiar cases. So we shouldn't expect it, and I don't think we do now. Um, but there was a sep separate point that you made that you picked up on this debt obsession, which is, um, you know, I don't know what countries you were thinking of, but I was thinking of countries that, um, uh, that have a lot of fiscal space, but that think that um, if they could drive debt lower, they could lead, they could bring about a firmer foundation for growth because, for two reasons. One, lower debt gives you more elbow room to be responsive, and lower debt means that you're going to have less distortive taxation, which is going to lead, lead to a firmer foundation for investment and all those things. That is all true. I have no quibble with that. The problem is you have to get from here to there. And, and the point about not obsessing is that you have to factor in the cost of getting from here to there. And the cost involves either jacking up distortive taxes or cutting productive spending, unless there's waste, which, of course, if there's waste, there's a free lunch. And, and it's, it's not factoring that cost, which is what I was getting at. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I should have said at the beginning, um, I was speaking, it, it's in the footnote on my first side, I was speaking <laughs> on my own behalf, not the fund. So that wasn't a question that I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. um, examples of win-win policies, we have a paper on, uh, from January, so two months ago, called Equity Efficiencies Trade-Offs in Structural Reform, and it's on the website. And it basically says, yeah, these equity efficiency trade-offs differ across reforms. So it is not that, you know, the trade-offs are always bad. Sometimes they're, they're, they're favorable. Um, uh, Davide talked about monetary policy. Um, and uh, the question on resource extraction, it, it wasn't a question, it was a comment, and, and, and I, I accept the comment. Thanks. Yes. So um, I, I wanted to respond to Governor Dulu's discussion about our relationship seven years ago on Tanzania. I think you are absolutely right, Governor, that at that time um, the name of the game was all about stability. And the discussions were all about stability. But I think since then, and it's a slow process, um, we have shifted. And uh, it, it's come uh, not only from our discussions then, but the majority of countries, especially low-income developing economies, where we were discussing with authorities stability, which is our mandate, but really the theme, what, what the authorities wanted to discuss is structural issues. Not far from stability, they wanted stability to be the key issue, but still also discuss structural reform, inequality, inclusion more generally. I think we can say now with uh, SPR being on the table that we have moved kind of a long way in doing that, and we have shown that even on issues like gender that we never talked about before. 
So on the question of about uh, environmental regulations, I mean, we try to keep the uh, reform indices as macro-critical as possible, things that we can actually take, it, take this to policies, so financial, even labor uh, product, these are things that we can actually influence. When we go to environmental regulation, as important as they are, we, it's more difficult for us. Now, even on environmental issues, we have papers that uh, show that climate change and natural disasters are macro-critical. But I think there is a big gap still to be filled to go to policy issues. Thank you. Yes, regarding the comments about uh, uh, demand policies and uh, distinguish between trend and cycle inequality, this is a, it's a very good point. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, mm, we don't pretend to argue that demand policies, they have uh, effect on trend inequality, as well as we don't argue that demand policies, they deeply have effect on trend output. Uh, but what, what this research shows is that, uh, both for fiscal and for monetary policies, that uh, when you think about uh, demand policies to uh, stabilize output, uh, these policies are not this distribution neutral. Uh, and luckily, this is, a, I think, the, the, the good outcome, at least compared to structural reform, is that when you look at the, 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 the cyclical effect that this policy has on distribution, there tends to be no really uh, equity efficiency trade-off. Uh, of course, a cycle uh, can last two years, or a cycle can last three years, as we have seen, for example, for... Uh, uh, large periods of accommodative monetary policies in many advanced economies, or as we have seen, uh, uh, many years of fiscal consolidation in other economies. So while these effects are likely to be cyclical, it doesn't mean that it uh, cannot be persistent. So actually, it can be persistent for, uh, for, for a few years, more years. And of course, they are going to influence policymakers in a way or another. I just would like to add on the uh, operational side and how these issues are dealt. Now, when we talk about the pilots, these have been done, as I mentioned, in about 40 countries at the end of this year, will be 45 countries for both inequality. This is a third of our membership. And uh, in these countries, as I said, is a variety of issues, but just the fact that policy, they are discussed and they are in the our analysis and recommendation, there is a distributional impact attached and a discussion about it and how to design and think policies in a way that, and reforms, in a way that those effects can be either minimized or mitigated or just changed in a way that policy become a win-win. Uh, I think this is a big, a big step that the fund has done. Mm -hmm. and, uh, among these countries, there are mainly surveillance, but we have cases of country with programs like Benin that has been just uh, done, um, just been published the staff report and review under the program, where there's been an analysis of fiscal reforms. What would that imply for, uh, from a distributional point of view? In case of gender, we have three countries, uh, Egypt, um, Jordan, and, and Niger where actually the, the conditionality on gender is there, is part of the program. Uh, so there are steps in this area. And as I say, the next, the decision is being made to more a systematic analysis of these issues in, pro, in, in cases where, again, uh, there is a macro criticality in a stake. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna take, Three more questions, but they're going to have to be very sharp and to, to the point. So, uh, number one, Louise. Number two, right at the very back. Anybody want to go for the third slot? Yeah. Number three here, sorry. <laughs> okay, so. So, uh, a few issues I want to know uh, if your advice has changed. First of all, what about exchange rate regimes and fixed uh, pegs and dollarization and whether overvaluation uh, increases inequality? Um, second of all, um, what about uh, commodity booms and commodity funds? And the third one is, you talked about um, globalization, but what about foreign direct investment? 
and how do you think low-income countries should cope with a lack of savings for investment? So, Sorry, I didn't want to make them easy. So three very, those are three very small questions to, for the fun to answer. <laughs> um, but let me, let me go right to the back and then we'll take the final one. And if the panel may not be able to, to answer all of these in, in full, the full detail uh, before we have to move to the next event, but please. I have two brief questions, and the first one goes to uh, Professor Ostri, um, and it specifies, uh, it's related to Sub-Saharan Africa. Over the last decade, there was a revival in growth in Sub-Saharan Africa, but remarkably, that growth has not been very inclusive and pro-job. Pro um, in fact, uh, most of that growth comes from the boom in commodities that was uh, talked about by uh, the previous uh, speaker. Um, is there any specific advice from the IMS perspective to try to link uh, the revival in growth in sub-Saharan Africa to reducing inequality through an, uh, uh, employment, for instance. Uh, and the second question quickly to uh, Governor Ndulu. Uh, exactly 30 years ago, Lucas decided that uh, because the welfare cost of business cycles in America is so low that the analysis of fluctuations in, in the United States is not important, and that's completely different from a uh, developing country's perspective. And there seems to be a kind of conundrum between uh, timing fluctuations or kick-starting uh, growth. So from your personal experience over the last 10 years, is that really an existing conundrum or it's just a myth? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then final word from the floor. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Diego Barrett from the World Bank. Used to be an RA at the IMF in your department. <laughs> so you can't ask any questions. Just across the street. <laughs> so I have a, a few comments uh, for Chris, uh, but uh, if Jonathan would like to jump in, it will be very interesting. Uh, first of all, congratulations on updating or creating this new database. I'm not sure if it is an update of the work of uh, Antonio uh, or is something new. Uh, so my comments are, first of all, uh, there is always this problem with these indices of endogeneity. Uh, so I once had the temerity of sharing something with uh, Darren Asimoglu when he came at the, at the fund, and he rightly pointed out uh, about the endogenous problem with these indices. So I was thinking about if you include in the data, data that is already available about uh, combining IMF programs, uh, the database with the data, so you can argue that the IMF program could be a sort of instrument to know when a, a structural form was endogenous to the country or was part of a conditionality agreement with the, with the fund. I'm not sure if that uh, could go well. About uh, also fiscal policy, um, something that I didn't saw in the data but I was uh, expecting to see. I know that FAD already has a lot of uh, data on tax reforms and uh, I was thinking if you can include that into the data, as Jonathan was uh, arguing before, and he proved that uh, fiscal policy and tax reform had a huge impact on distribution and therefore on, on growth. Then if I was thinking ahead, if you have this data and then you do some macro analysis or growth analysis and you don't have fiscal policy, then you're missing a big component of that uh, reform. And uh, finally, I uh, was also thinking within the financial openness uh, about including something that a uh, previous uh, person asked about exchange rate uh, regimes. One might think uh, of, uh, of uh, moving from one regime to another regime as a structural reform. Here the question is, what is a structural reform? But I think uh, the work that Rex and Mabach had, had done on this, they already measure uh, some of this, so you can perhaps include that. You, perhaps it not, will not be ready for January, but uh, you can think about that. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you very much. I'm, we're now badly eating up the time of the next event. So um, I'm going to give Jonathan the last word, subject to the condition that you can finish it before that turns to 08. So a last 30 second response, because then I've got to hand over to Stefan to take um, 
last. So clearly you're not going to be able to answer these yeah. questions. So if you just have a final uh, word or two. You know, thank you. Thank you for the questions. So let, me, let me just say that um, countries have the, uh, un, you, the unilateral right to choose their regimes, but their, their exchange rate regimes. But there is interesting work going on right now at the fund about how we operationalize the advice, given that most countries are, are gravitating to managed floats. Overvaluation uh, issues, very interesting work. Uh, there's a paper by Andy Berg uh, recently on this, and there's a paper uh, with a couple of colleagues by myself uh, on that issue. Uh, FDI is the bright spot in financial globalization. And uh, I let, uh, well, you don't. I don't know. Okay. I, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I think we, we've got to just uh, pull it too close. Three very quick things. Number one, let me thank all the panelists and our discussion. It was a great uh, session, so thank you very much indeed.